Hi, I'm Jason Allen, a manager for wheelchair tennis for USTA National as well as a USPTA certified elite professional. And I'm Jason Harnett. I am the national manager here at the USTA for wheelchair tennis and head coach, also a USPTA certified professional. Today we'll be discussing the similarities and differences between able body tennis and wheelchair tennis. There are some similarities, but there are some distinct differences that you guys need to know when you start to work with athletes with disabilities. You know, let's talk about the differences between able body tennis uh, and wheelchair tennis. Uh, there are some distinct dis uh, differences between the two. I have a unique perspective on this, Jason. You know, being brand new to wheelchair tennis, I've only been involved in the sport for a year and a half now uh, and spent, of course, 20 years as an able body coach. And although these things to you are very, very commonplace and in the back of your mind, they're brand new to me. And, and uh, one of the major differences I've noticed thus far is the differences in mobility patterns, uh, which are inherently different from able body patterns. Um, and for me as a new coach, understanding disability specific limitations of athletes and how to um, build relationships and establish a rapport with those, those athletes to figure out how they tick um, are, are huge to me. You've really got to pay a lot more attention to the athlete and figure out what they can and can't do and push the envelope to see if they can go farther than what they think they can do. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. I mean, that's exactly uh, the challenge I think to you pros out there coming in, into the sport. Uh, the chair itself and disability can be quite intimidating, right. um, but I think uh, the relationship that you build with the athletes is really going to be the, the key element to having success uh, when working in wheelchair tennis. I agree, and the chair, the chair in and of itself seems to be a daunting piece of material for, for, for able-bodied coaches. We get scared of the chair, but as you progress in coaching it, you, you, you find that the chair is not even there anymore. It's just an extension of the athlete in, in and of himself. That's right. I mean, tennis for these guys is absolutely no different. We know there's one rule difference, uh, the two bounce rule. Right. Um, but as far as, as we'll get into later, the chair set up and so forth, uh, every athlete's going to be set up differently. Disabilities are very different. You may have a, an athlete with uh, a similar disability as another, yet their chair sets, sets up differently. Um, and that's something to take into consideration. But I think what you said about athletes being pushed to do something that maybe they believe they cannot do is, is absolutely essential in what we do and what you guys are going to be doing. So as you notice, a couple of changes have occurred. I'm sitting in a tennis wheelchair at the moment, and for me as a coach, it's one of the most impactful opportunities to learn the sport is to play in the chair and learn the ins and outs of it. Also to my right, we have Chris Herman, who is a former number one junior in the world, two-time back-to-back junior world champion, and one of our current professional athletes uh, that, we help, that we're helping develop at the moment through USTA. Um, he's currently ranked 51 in the world, Chris? Hey everybody, I'm happy to be here uh, to help out, show you a little sign about wheelchair tennis. Uh, just a little background information on me. I was injured when I was 10 in a car accident. Uh, I went for a couple years where I just did you know, really nothing. I just kind of sat around. I got fat, right? So I, we started to look for something to do, something to you know, get me out there because I used to play a lot of sports. So I used to play like football, soccer, and all that. I thought tennis was boring, but you know, that's a different story. So <laughs> eventually we came out, we found a few clinics, a few local clinics, just by a local coach out in uh, Clearwater, Florida. So mm -hmm. I started going to him weekly and just fell in love with it from there. Uh, started my first tournament uh, in 2013, I want to say, 2012, around there. And just from there, it took off. I met Jason and uh, met the team and everything and just took off from there. And now I'm here today. So uh, We're so thankful that you're here to help us. And, and so what we'll segue into is the chair itself. The chair itself is really, I think, the most critical piece to all of this. The, the, the most intimidating for you guys out there. You know, disability is one thing, but the chair setup and the way these chairs operate um, are, are critical for your understanding if you're going to coach. Something you can notice right away that's different uh, from, say, an everyday chair, the chair that Chris maybe came into this building in. An everyday chair has zero degree camber, which is where you see uh, the chairs maybe about the width of a person. Uh, and that's designed to go through doorways and, and ADA compliant buildings and so forth. Uh, but these chairs, as you can see, are very, very different. Even, even by just looking at them, they seem athletic. Okay, and that's because of the camber you see in the wheels here. The camber is typically set uh, between 18 and 24 degrees. And uh, most athletes will probably be in the 20 range. Um, and that, that provides that athletic base, the wider base, that allows the chairs to be very, very agile. If Chris can turn around for me here, you can see in the back of the chair we have an anti-tip bar. And that does two things. Obviously it stops athletes from going backwards and flipping backwards uh, in high speed turning. Uh, but it also it gives the athletes more confidence 
uh, in, in serving. So when they're reaching back, you're perfectly safe to lean back and, and serve uh, as traditionally as we, as we want to be. Okay, this chair here, as you can see, we have different pieces in the back that can adjust what we call the dump. That would be the, the actual seat itself. Uh, and traditionally, if you have someone with, say, a relatively high level injury, a thoracic level injury, say a T6, T7, T up to T12, you would probably have this part of the chair sit down lower where their rear end would be below their knees. And that would allow them to obviously keep their balance a little bit better, but also uh, have an easier time pushing the chair. Athletes that maybe are amputees or non-spinal cord injuries are going to take this and try and move it as high as they can. Okay, and this is important to talk to the athlete about when you're setting up the chair. Uh, because what that does is if balance isn't an issue, they're going to try and sit up as high as they can so they can focus more on their ball striking and maybe a little less aggressive on the push. Uh, this chair that Chris is in here for the higher level athletes that have really found uh, a chair that they like, the dimensions that they like, all these chairs are really fitted uh, for the athlete specifically. So if you look at his chair closely, we call this a fixed frame. If you notice, there are no adjustable parts. This is one frame uh, that from one piece of metal that they basically they molded to Chris's dimensions and specific to what his disability level is. And so this is really the end game for chairs. This is where you want to be when you've played a long time, you, you, you're done growing, uh, your disability's not changing, and you know what you like. I just wanted to talk about the strapping real fast. If you notice that both Chris's chair and my chair, we have these, these lap belts, and, and he has some other devices here to help him stay more snug in the chair. The more loose the body is in the chair, the more off balance you'll be and wobbly in the chair. So by having lap belts and strapping legs together, you stay more tight and the chair is responsive to the body. If you notice when you're doing drills with players that they seem to be a, quite a bit off balance, that's where you can step in and say, hey, maybe we should talk about using belts or additional strapping devices to stabilize your body. But maybe Chris can help me uh, talk about you know, the dynamics of a chair and what happens when you push and what happens when you pull, what happens when you pull with your non-dominant hand, your non-racket hand. Um, you know, what does the chair do when it does that? To really get it, you have to get in the chair and just experience it for yourself and just spend time in the chair to know, you know, if I pull on the left wheel, turn backwards kind of, or push on the left wheel, go forward to the right. You know, it's just kind of, you got to play in the chair and then you'll start to understand it as you go. Uh, that's mostly what I'd say. I mean, it's hard to get into all the nuances. Uh, without playing in it, so it's, yeah, the thing, the thing that will teach you the most by far is definitely getting in the chair and just pushing around, not even playing, but just pushing around, taking laps around the court, just moving around, picking up balls with it or anything like that. I think that's critical, getting in the chair, spending time in the chair, messing up in the chair, and realizing that this is something new for you guys, uh, and maybe even someone newly injured who's been in a chair maybe just a few months, it's still, it's still relatively new to them. A couple things I would add uh, when we talk about athletic pushes, right? Learning how to push um, in an athletic way out here. Uh, using a clock analogy is sometimes an easy way for, for people to get this. If I turn sideways for you, I would say with my hands directly on top of the wheel, we would say that's a 12 o'clock start, right? Um, that's a strong, this is a strong start uh, say maybe on a return of serve or after I serve the ball getting out of the hole so to speak I need short powerful bursts right and that typically is going to be a very short push from 12 to say 2 at that point my arms are extended that's as much as I'm going to get out of that push and then I'm going to reach back and grab again and again and again from that 12 to 2 o'clock position that will be enough to get you moving once the chair is going and you've got some momentum, you're probably going to lengthen out those pushes. Because you don't want to sit there doing short burst, short burst, short burst, short burst. You're just not going to gain that much speed. At some point, you've got to get the wheels really working. And so we might do a deeper grab around 11 o'clock and then crank to two. 11 to two once we're moving. Those are really the two pushes that you're going to utilize, I think, during a match. Uh, and it's just determined upon uh, what you're doing. If I'm going from, again, either a slow moving position or sitting position to get out of the hole quickly, I'm going to do 12 to 2. And once I'm moving and the speed is up a little bit, I then lengthen it out from 11 to 2 o'clock. Does that make sense? And everything we do, this is important, 
uh, you're almost never, when you're playing, and I don't care if you're a beginner or you're a professional like Chris, you're, you're just rarely gonna be pulling backwards to, to, to make a play. You may make one pull back to turn to get out of the way to make a hit, um, but the reality is if you're actually backpedaling, you're in big trouble. Typically, and almost always, we're always moving forward. Right? If you think about it, I'm always moving forward. Even when I turn and have my back to my opponent, I'm technically, yes, going away from the net, away from the court, but I'm actually moving forward. Okay? And that is a concept you really want to keep on the forefront, that this backing up mentality. And your beginner players will have that mentality. As a ball comes towards them, or you know, comes at their body, they're going to want to do this. And as we all know, when you back up like that, all you're doing is delaying the inevitable. The ball is going to get to you eventually. So the correct move is to maybe make one little pull back to get out of the way so you can make a play, if that makes sense. So I think from this little talk here, I think you're going to have a pretty good understanding of what the chair does. And as Chris said, if I push on my left wheel, I'm going to move to the right. If I pull on the left wheel, I'm going to move to the left. If I push on my right, I'm going to move left. And if I pull on my right, I'm going to move right. And that, as Chris said, the more you spend time in the chair, you're going to start to really understand what the chair's capabilities are. Okay? And there will be some frustration, but man, I'm telling you, for us teaching pros to be able to sit down and do something different like this, it's really engaging. And again, as coaches, you guys really have to do this. You really cannot coach wheelchair tennis without spending time in this chair. It is absolutely essential that you have an understanding of what your athletes are going through and what the limitations uh, of this chair are. Okay, so as you can see, we're kind of set up here for our mobility pattern work. Uh, and we're gonna talk about a few different things that are really critical for you guys as coaches to emphasize with your players. So basically what we'll start with is what we call an inside turn or turning in. Uh, and that's gonna be for a right-handed player in this drill uh, off of the forehand side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start from relatively the center of the court. You're gonna notice I'm gonna begin pushing with both hands evenly on uh, the push rims or the tires themselves. And I'm gonna go around that cone there. And at this stage, what I'm gonna do is add an actual forehand uh, so you guys can see the stroke itself uh, with the inside turn that I'm talking about and the recovery. And I'll try and talk through it as I do it and then Chris will follow. So as you can see, I'm pushing towards, this is really gonna be the contact point where the ball's arriving and I will be striking the ball. And at that point, I'll be turning around, turning into the court, so to speak. Hence the name turning in or inside turn. From there, I will recover to the center of the court. While I am recovering, again, pushing evenly, I will be looking over my inside shoulder up court to see where the ball is coming from. It's at this point, that I have to make a decision whether I'm gonna to continue to my right or go to my left, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that, pretty simply put, is an inside turn, and Chris will demonstrate now. So what I would ask Chris here is, how important is your non-dominant hand, the hand that's not holding the racket, when you make a turn like that, where you're turning offensively, that's important. The inside turn is kind of an offensive style turn. Uh, how does that left hand help you? I would definitely say it's the, one of the most important points of the turn um, besides hitting. So you hit and then you're grabbing with this wheel and it's your first push after. So you kind of hit and then you turn and then you push with your left hand. So it's kind of doing all the work for that turn, which is where you generate your power and your movement and how you get started going to the next ball. So yeah, I'd say that the, the left hand is really important to not lift it up off the wheel to swing the racket, uh, to keep it there and you know, go through your push with the left hand. And the left hand generally will not leave the wheel for any long period of time. There might be an issue where you're reaching out for a ball, but you're going to get that hand back on the wheel as quickly as possible. So if you notice that your students are, are pushing and hitting, trying an inside turn and, and, and losing their balance because their hand's not on the wheel, that would be something that would be absolutely critical for you guys to point out to them, to remind them to get their non-dominant hand back down on the wheel. One more question I would ask Chris, that when he pushes the chair itself, what grip would he use uh, to, to make an effective push? Uh, for me, I use semi-western, uh, you know, forehand grip, uh, just because um, it's the easiest to push. The racket's not as intrusive at that point. 
Um, and also, as the ball is coming, you're pushing, you have to be able to get your hand off the wheel and swing at the ball. So if you were any other grip, it would just take too long to uh, use to change grips and swing. So definitely semi-Western forehand grip. Yep. I think it's obvious to everybody now, uh, and, and again, it's not obvious at the beginning for, for able-bodied coaches who are getting engaged in this, is we have to do everything with our hands and our arms, right? We have to push, we have to turn, we have to grab for balance. And so the amount of time you have between arriving at the hit itself and beginning to move again is way, way less than an able-bodied player. And also part of these patterns that we're showing you, uh, it's also evident that we are recovering with our back to our opponent. Okay, that's a really critical part. Clearly we can't move lateral and we can't jump. So that concept, I think, at the beginning for coaches is, is difficult. Uh, I remember the first time I started coaching, uh, I found myself kind of lurching in the chair. My instincts were telling me to go. And I had to remember, and again, going back to the strapping and the chair setup segment we talked about, if you can lock your legs down, the instinct to use your legs slowly starts to go away. Because you, you just you feel uh, like you're, st you're truly strapped in. So that being said, I think we have to remind ourselves, once we're done hitting, we have to get our hands back down. And as Chris alluded to, that left hand or your right hand, if you're a lefty, that non-dominant hand is absolutely critical to keep on the wheel. So we'll go through this inside turn one more time, and we'll both go through it maybe a little bit faster. And as we progress, as your athletes get better at pushing, especially with the racket in their hand, and I would suggest at the beginning, get the racket in their hand right away. Don't allow them to put the racket in between their knees and push. You see a lot of beginners do this. Some players have gone as far as to put the racket behind them. And when they arrive for the hit, they try and pull it out. Don't allow any of that. Okay, make sure the racket's in their hand from the get-go. Uh, and again, as they progress, the speed in which they come around these turns, this inside turn to begin with, should get better. Because the more momentum you have in the chair, am I right about that? The momentum in the chair, uh, it's going to make it easier to keep the chair moving. Again, it's once a body in motion, once a stay in motion. You, never want to stop. you don't want to stop pushing. Because once you stop, the amount of energy it takes to get the chair moving again, uh, the ball is going to be past you. It would be like an able body player standing flat footed uh, waiting for the ball to be struck. It's the same problem. So Chris and I can demonstrate now. Uh, again, focusing on the left hand, we've got the semi-western grip to push in and also when we recover as we make that inside turn back towards the center here, we're going to look over our inside shoulder to make sure we're looking back up court to see the ball that's coming in our direction. So look for those points right now. Notice I'm moving through the turn. We'll go through maybe one more time just to get the idea and use that left hand to maybe pull to make the turn and notice we look over our inside shoulder to see where the ball is coming from. That essentially is the inside turn. On the backhand side or for a lefty, a lefty this obviously would be the inside turn for them but for right-handed players we're going we're to demonstrate now an outside turn. Okay, we are going to use the same grip for the moment for pushing. Depending upon what type of backhand we hit, we'll determine if we have to change our grip, maybe for a slice backhand to continental. And again, that is going to be something we need to practice because there is a quick flip. In able body tennis, we may use what? Our non-dominant hand to help us change our grip. You don't have that luxury in wheelchair tennis. Okay, you're going to have to do it on the fly. So when we demonstrate this, an outside turn would be where we turn away from the center of the court or we're turning out to the outside and recovering. And so I'll demonstrate that right now. Again, the same principle with the left hand, the same idea of looking over my inside shoulder when I'm recovering to see the ball uh, coming from the other side. So as you can see, I'm going to go through this and Chris can follow. Notice I have my left hand and I look over my inside shoulder, as Chris does as well. He demonstrated a topspin backhand there. We'll do it one more time. Come through, I'll demonstrate the slice. Coming through, turning my head, looking over my inside shoulder, and recovering back towards the center of the court. So right there we've covered an inside turn and an outside turn. By the nature of these turns, the offensive turn is the inside turn. That is where you're really generating most of your power into the ball and sending it back up court. Whereas you can see on this side, 
we are turning away, it's not necessarily a defensive hit, but more of a neutral hit, more of a neutral ball, maybe buying you some time to recover. You can hit an offensive shot, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, with the topspin backhand. But again, the, it's important to understand, and you will understand once you get in the chair, it's the inertia, I'll run through this very quickly, on this backhand in this particular outside turn, with my swing, the actual energy wants to go left. So with that in mind, a mistake in this particular pattern would be where, and maybe I'll have Chris demonstrate it, so Chris, once you jump in, what I want you to do is do a slice back in and then turn into the court. So instead of turning out, we turn in and then he turns in. The natural problem with that is going to be if he does not do enough with his hit in this particular turn, say he makes a mistake, hits and should have gone this way and turns in, you can notice his court positioning is going to be quite poor and he's vulnerable to be being passed on the opposite side. These turns are really designed for recovery uh, and creating space. The third turn that we're going to demonstrate here is called, it's called reverse mobility. And this turn is critical to learn because again, going back to the emphasizing that we cannot move laterally while sitting in a chair, notice all these patterns are circular in nature. Uh, and notice the way the cones are set up, our recoveries are almost always at a 45 degree angle. That's also critical. And our approach to the ball and these particular turns are 45 degree angles. The problem with making the angle either too flat or too steep is important to emphasize. So when you're working with these athletes, and so I come around here, and instead of recovering back at the 45 that we have set, which is a really clean line, I decide to recover flat. The problem with this is I'm vulnerable to the ball that goes behind me because the, the size of my turn is enormous and I'm going to be blind to the court for that moment. So with that being said, the next move we're going to show you um, will help, help cover for that and it's called reverse mobility. Um, and I'll demonstrate it and then maybe Chris can jump in as to why this, this particular turn is so important. And I'll demonstrate it on the forehand side for right-handed players to start and you can see the difference in this turn. So to describe it, I push forward Say I'm playing Chris himself, I make my strike cross court, I'm recovering like I should, and Chris decides not to go to the open court but hit behind me. Well, I can't just turn and run after it, obviously. I have to go after it. So the mistake would be to turn into the court. Because if you notice, when I turn in, I end up closer to the baseline and I lose space, and Chris's ball will go right by me. So the answer in this turn would be for me to continue on this line he hits behind me and I turn this way. And notice I'm further away from the baseline and I have some room to make a play. This play clearly, for the most part, is a defensive play, right? It's, gonna, it's just gonna basically protect you from, from the ball getting past you. It's your best chance. So this is a, is, is a little bit of a tricky turn to teach, but it's important that we learn how to cover the ball that goes behind you so I come this way, I make my hit, I'm looking over my inside shoulder, and then maybe to do it, again, going back to your non-dominant hand, I will pull on my left hand to help me make that turn faster. Is there anything I'm missing there, or why that might be? Uh, I think you hit all the points. I just want to you know, pull attention to, again, it's your left hand making the turn as you're coming out. Um, and then the other thing I'd say is it's just something that your players would have to do a lot because the natural reaction is to want to turn into the court and always see the ball so you just got to kind of keep doing it and doing it until it becomes second nature to turn out and uh, play a defensive ball like that. Okay so what we're going to try and tie in here for you guys is one particular drill with the mobility patterns that we've learned that you've seen us do. Uh, it's called the hub drill. This drill is internationally known throughout the wheelchair tennis community as the premier drill as far as adding mobility and, and possibly some hitting as well. So maybe what I'll have Chris do is run through uh, a pattern and you guys should be able to see now in this particular drill all three turns being utilized. So he's going to move to his right first showing an inside or turn in pattern. Then he's going to recover out. He's going to hit a backhand on this side, on the ad side, showing again an, a turning out pattern. and then he'll come back and he'll do one more forehand on this side showing reverse mobility on this side. Okay. 
So hopefully that was pretty clear. Uh, the beauty of having it on video, you guys can stop it and watch it again, and again, and again, and again. And you can have your, your students watch it again, because I think it's really important to fight nature here, as Chris said, the natural instinct, last time, on this reverse mobility is to do what? Here comes the ball behind me, is to go this way. And that is the mistake we're trying to work through by really emphasizing reverse mobility as being the correct way uh, to make these to make these attempts at balls that go behind you. Okay, so I know we covered a lot with the use of our non-dominant hand is a big deal. Semi-western grip if you can uh, to help push better and actually have an offensive threat right away. Uh, we have the inside turn, we have the outside turn, and we have reverse mobility. Uh, that is your whole life out here in wheelchair tennis uh, and not much more than that. So real quick, what we're gonna do here now, you just saw Chris do the hub pattern in its, in its completion. Uh, what we're gonna do now is do a little progression. We're gonna add a, the ball element. All of you guys, I think, uh, are gonna be at this level for a little while. Um, to get into, you know, if you're dealing with beginning level players, I think, you know, getting to rallying and so forth and even feeding from the other side of the court might be a bit daunting. And it's something you need to practice because if you notice, we've got four particular spots that Chris is gonna be hitting the ball. This also means your feeds are gonna to have to be really accurate. And that might be something that you need to practice. So as a coach, if you notice what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna add the ball element, but I'm also gonna keep a dynamic, meaning I'm not going to be stationary. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a toss like this and just get out of his way. Let him make a, a, a clean hit. And as he recovers, I'll recover. And as he comes up to the next point of contact, what I might do is either jump to my left or to my right. Again, just trying to get out of his hitting path. When you're coming forward like that, you're just you're trying to attack. You're trying to put the guy in a defensive position. Usually you won't follow it in too much and looking for that, you'll do you'll still recover, still do all that, but you're looking to attack. What we'll do is we'll run through it twice in a row. Okay, one time again like we just did it. The second time we go through it, we're not going to emphasize the recovery on the front cones. We're going to let Chris maybe go for a more aggressive shot to try and finish. Because as you can see, and as we've, uh, we've demonstrated earlier, there, the lateral mobility is not there and we can't go up. So if Chris decides to stay in, the odds of him getting lobbed are quite high and a ball getting past him or over him. So the idea is the recovery, but on the second time through, we'll have him go for it and try and finish the point. We're gonna have him be more aggressive and maybe not emphasize the recovery on the front two cones. And now we can demonstrate with a ball strike the reverse mobility that we talked about before. Okay, and we'll go through this just one time so you can see it in action, okay? Notice he used a second bounce there, which is really important. Knocks the cone out of the way, which is totally fine. He'll recover, and then I'll go behind. Use the second bounce, and maybe use a slice there. So as you can see, the hub drill that we just did covers all aspects of mobility that we talked about, the inside turns, the outside turns, the reverse mobility, uh, adds a little bit of stroke production to it. Um, you can start with no ball and let them go through the pattern until they really understand the pattern well. And as they progress, you can add the hand toss, which is not only more accurate for you guys, but I would also add the element of moving with them uh, and then getting out of the way of their flight path, their hitting path, so you don't get hit. Um, and it keeps it as realistic as possible for them. And with the addition of that reverse mobility, you can toss the ball as they're recovering back to the hub, the center of the court. You can throw the ball back behind them uh, and see how they handle that reverse mobility. That aspect is critical, being that athletes with disabilities can't move laterally. So you've got to make sure that uh, you emphasize that because that is a very real challenge, I think, to these athletes on the court. Okay, so we're going to talk about stroke production now. Um, I think what you're going to find is there's not much variation uh, between able body stroke production and, and wheelchair athletes stroke production. We'll cover uh, the forehand side with the semi-western grip, which again is the same grip that Chris pushes in. One aspect I'd like you guys to pay attention to on the forehand side is Chris's non-dominant hand, his left hand in this situation. And you're going to notice as he swings the racket uh, through on the forehand, he's going to pull back on his left wheel to simulate his uh, his hips, 
Um, because, you know, Chris has a spinal cord injury, he maybe doesn't have that hip rotation um, that maybe a non-spinal cord injury athlete would have, an amputee of the such. And so what he's going to do is utilize the chair to turn both his body weight and the chair weight into the ball as he strikes it. And you'll notice that uh, when he swings here, that you'll see that wheel turn and his chair will rotate into the ball. And here we're going to start with a semi-western forehand. Okay? We'll go through five hits. You got it? Okay, here we go. Again, you can see that left hand pull as he makes contact to rotate the chair through it. Notice how still his head is, just like every tennis player should have is a still head when they make contact. Uh, but you can see all the dynamics there. One aspect that you'll, you'll look at there when he does it is take back. Uh, he will not have the racket head well above his, his hand, kind of in that classical loop position. You'll see him take his racket back on a lower plane, and that's simply to make a very quick, compact hit, and then to get his hands back down on the wheels. So when you're teaching, you don't want to teach these grand swings because, again, we don't have the lower extremities to help us move. We've got to get our hands back on the chair, and so you just don't have that much time. When you're ball striking, you don't want it to be as flat as a lot of what I've noticed um, able-bodied players hit. Um, you want a lot more loop on your ball. You want it a lot more net clearance and stuff. So that way, when you do recover, you have a lot more time than if you hit a flatter ball, the guy who gets the ball a lot quicker. Whereas, you know, the loopier ball will also give trouble to the wheelchair player, but will also give you a lot of time to recover. Okay, so we're back here with more stroke production on the backhand side. And I think we're going to start with the slice backhand. Um, in wheelchair tennis, I think it's probably the most commonly used um, at the beginning levels and the intermediate levels. It's just because their racket face is open, it just makes it easier to get that ball over the net. Um, and again, stroke production for someone in a chair is really not going to be very different. The only difference is going to be, obviously, that non-dominant hand again on the left wheel. That is going to be critical if you don't have balance. So if you're dealing with an athlete with a spinal cord injury, you're going to notice most of those athletes almost never let go of either the frame of the chair or the wheel itself. And they use that to stabilize their body as they're hitting. Uh, if you had someone who is maybe a, a relatively high level injury um, and they didn't put their left hand on the wheel, you would notice as they swung they would be, they would be off balance. And that's a problem. That takes time away from their recovery. Um, and so Chris will, will, will recognize that and put that left hand on the wheel. But you'll notice from a stroke production, it's really no different than what you would teach. Um, a relatively abbreviated backswing using the continental grip uh, that we all know. A nice you know, extended uh, finish with a slight high to low path. Um, just like, again, like you guys teach at home. Uh, again, pay attention to the left hand. It really is critical. If you had a non-spinal cord injury who had perfect balance, again, an amputee or someone who has maybe a, a degenerative situation where they don't have an injury, um, they may be able to let go of the wheel and show more of a traditional uh, slice backhand, you know, where that left arm drops back as a counterbalance. So again, that's no different than what you guys would teach. So Chris will demonstrate for us now uh, the slice backhand uh, and that left hand on the wheel. All right, five balls. One thing to, to note here, different than the forehand, where we asked Chris to pull back on the wheel to simulate his hips, in this situation, he's going to want to be a little bit more stationary. Um, there really is no other way to do that on a, on a backhand, I would say. There really is no pull or push on that wheel. It's just more about stability. Okay? And then what he would focus on after the hit, of course, is getting his hands down and recovering. And that's the slice backhand. So what we're going to talk about now is called the inverted backhand. This is the, the backhand that scares everybody to death, I think. Uh, it's just technically not something that we as able-bodied coaches really teach very much. I, I've seen some able-bodied pros do this. Uh, maybe if it's a player of smaller stature and the ball gets up high above their shoulder, you may see them go over with that semi-western just to get a, a high loopy ball to recover. Um, but this is a very commonly used backhand in wheelchair tennis. Again, because the athletes sit at a lower point, um, I think it just makes balls that are maybe armpit level, shoulder level, easier to handle. Um, and, and actually low balls, if you'll see Chris's technique here, you may see him lean down a little bit with his hand. Once again, on the left wheel for stability, uh, you're going to see him reach down. Uh, one technique we suggest for you guys when you have a foul through with an inverted backhand, um, this, is, uh, this is an old Dutch trick, is to show your armpit to your opponent. It's an easy thing to, 
to, to use analogies with your players, as you guys know, you use them in all your lessons. But this one for an inverted backhand is just to remind the player to get a nice long follow through. Again, showing the armpit forward is an easy thing to remember. And it just, it just invites extension because the, the, the common mistake in this stroke is to maybe shorten the finish or even roll the hand over, and that is common. So what we try and promote is just if you're going to miss, miss long and have a nice long swing and follow through. And Chris can demonstrate uh, this stroke for us here with maybe five hits. Okay, so let's see how he does. You ready? Okay. So notice his left hand again stabilizing himself on that, on that, in the chair. There it is, the inverted backhand. Okay, it doesn't look different shape-wise maybe uh, than a, a traditional eastern backhand. The eastern backhand you might obviously have a little bit more drive to the ball. Um, but as far as technically speaking, I think it's important to recognize he doesn't have that loop in the backswing. It's kind of a muted lower take back uh, and then a drop and then a finish. Uh, and that again, that is just there so he can get his hands back down on the, on the wheels as quickly as possible. Um, tell me, what would you, you know, if you had the choice between both, and I know it's situational, you know, do I use the top, do I use the slice? I mean, because you do both well, but you use them, I think, correctly. I mean, w you know, when do you use one, when do you use the other? I would say, because I'm more comfortable, um, top spinning balls. So, uh, for me, on the whole, I'll be top spinning. Uh, slice is really just kind of, not an, I wouldn't say an emergency shot, but, um, more of a very situational if the ball's real low or if they, they get a slice low it's, or a defensive shot. It's not really what I'm looking to hit though. Maybe a ball at your body. Right, right. Yeah, more defensive. Uh, I'd say more defensive overall. Um, but yeah, mostly for me personally, I'm take, trying to take as many topspin back ends as I can. So it's important, you know, when you deal with an athlete like someone like Chris, you know, who's a very high level athlete, um, has played a long time, then his tactical philosophy may shift to where he is looking to hit as much topspin as possible to stay as offensive as possible. But for you guys dealing with beginning level athletes, I think you'll find the slice is a great starting point. Um, it doesn't mean don't introduce topspin, absolutely introduce it, but I think you're going to find at the beginning uh, that athletes are going to have a little bit more success uh, with, with the slice, getting that ball in play. Um, and then from there you can start to uh, adjust uh, obviously the grips and try and introduce uh, again, a different swing pattern as well as we all know. Um, and I think from a progressive standpoint, I, it's really important that when you're going through stroke production, um, obviously mobility is very distinctive to wheelchair tennis, but from a stroke production standpoint, I think you should treat beginning athletes especially, just like you would you know, treat any, any beginning level able-bodied kid or adult you would deal with. I think you would start them on the service line. You would start them with drop feeds. Let them you know, get comfortable in the chair and, and go through these strokes from a drop position. And then from there, you guys progress to this position to where you're maybe 10 or 15 feet away, letting the athlete track the ball, the one bounce and the hit. Uh, you can even simulate a two bounce to where he gets used to that second bounce and, and knowing how to handle that. And then from there, we progress to the other side. And ultimately, as players get better, we progress to uh, rallying, live ball. Uh, so we all know that progression. So that's why I think ultimately with all this, it shouldn't be that scary for you guys. It should be a, a pretty comfortable place. We're all very comfortable on the court. Um, and this information here that we just gave you probably shouldn't sound that different than what you've been teaching your athletes. Again, the inverted backhand might be the only aspect that takes a little bit of practice. And once again, I would suggest, and Chris has suggested before, the only way you learn how to do this stuff is you do it, right? So that means you guys getting in the chair and potentially, like, again, with your athletes that you work with at home, I would suggest teaching wheelchair athletes how to feed the balls themselves and letting you be in the chair and they feed the ball to you so they start to see things from your perspective as well. It kind of goes both ways. As we're all, we all do with our able-bodied kids that we work with, we have them feeding balls. It's important they have that skill. It's important these athletes have this skill as well uh, because in the end, they're all going to give back to the sport in some capacity. Chris can go and, and work a, a wheelchair camp or heck even an able body camp very easily with the information that he has uh, and again the information that you guys just learned here on stroke production. Covered a lot of stuff today in wheelchair tennis. We really hope you guys enjoyed it. We covered 
you know, chair setup, uh, mobility patterns, stroke production, uh, all that can seem pretty intimidating. It does seem a little intimidating, it especially was for me when I first started in wheelchair tennis, but the knowledge that I have in coaching able body tennis is all you need to start a program or start working with an athlete. Like Jason said in an earlier session, the athlete, him or herself, will let you know what they can and cannot do. And again, we try to push that envelope. Um, as I progress through my experience in coaching wheelchair tennis, I don't even recognize the chair anymore. I see an, a, a tennis player and we go through tennis drills just like you would in any other arena. And um, it's at the end of the day for me, probably the most gratifying coaching experience of my life. I, I can tell you going back to the beginning, I had the same, same feelings that you did. Uh, the intimidation with the chair, and intimidation with disability. But I can tell you like any other students that we teach as pros, they love and absorb the learning uh, and everything that we give them and we get it tenfold back to us. Um, so I think that will get you motivated and know that these athletes are looking for, for pros and help like, like any other players that you guys work with. So I think it's critical keeping that in mind and, and again, uh, do something new. It's different. That was something that was very exciting to me back in the beginning was you know, teaching able body tennis for as long as we have. To do something different in tennis uh, was exciting. Uh, and then when you really delve into it, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful place to be and, and a wonderful population. So it part, is part of our community. And if you're interested in starting your own program, please reach out to the USPTA or reach out to both Jason and myself here at USTA National and we can guide you through the steps of how to start a program. And sections as well. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you guys.